This is Weiwen Chow, and welcome to Discharge and Remedies for Breach of Contract, Module 3C, Part C. We will now start examining the different types of remedies for a breach of contract. So what that, what that is, what a remedy is, where, where an innocent party sues for a breach of contract, a remedy is what a court will provide as, uh, as redress for that breach breach of contract so that there are different types of remedies that a court may order the first one that's on that's on this list in the table of contents here is a discharge by breach by breach of condition so we've already examined that when we were talking uh, about what, about the different types of discharge so we won't repeat that uh, again here so we'll, we'll we'll jump to looking at at damages and there are a number of different types of damages the first and most common type of damages is called expectation damages here's a list of the different types of remedies that a court may award for a breach of contract uh, first is a discharge due to a breach of condition second is some some kind of damages third is specific performance and fourth is injunction. As I mentioned before in the previous slide, we won't repeat again the explanation of a discharge due to a breach of condition. Um, but in this in this particular part, we will focus on on damages, or or, or more specifically, expectation damages. When a court orders damages, what it's doing is it's ordering the breaching party, the, the party who breached the contract, to pay some amount of money to the innocent party to compensate for that breach of contract. How those damages are, are determined uh, will vary depending on the specific type of damages that are being, being awarded. Uh, this is a chart that summarizes uh, a number of different kinds uh, kinds of damages. I won't go through this chart, but I, I did highlight in red the types of damages that that we will examine. So those are expectation damages, nominal damages, liquidated damages, and punitive damages. With expectation damages, we're compensating the innocent party to put that innocent party or the plaintiff in the same financial position as, as if the contract had been properly performed so the 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 mathematical equation is ex expectation damages equals expected benefits minus the expected cost so the expected benefits are the benefits that would have been received if the contract had been performed and the expected costs are the costs that the innocent party would have incurred if the contract had been properly performed To get a better understanding of expectation damages, let's now look at this quick quiz question. Please pause this video for a few moments so that you may have a look at the, at the question and to try to figure out what you think is the answer. The answer here is B, 20,000. So we get to 20,000 by calculating the, the expected damages uh, being equal to the, the expected benefit the expected benefit that Ar Armand expected to receive if the contract had been performed would have been $100,000. He would have received $100,000 from Melanie. So that expected uh, benefit is, uh, we, we, we minus from that expected benefit, the expected costs of Armand. His expected cost is 80000 The widget cost him $80,000. So it's 100000 minus 80000 which gives us the $20,000. We've already pointed out that expectation damages is to put a plaintiff or innocent party in the same financial position as if the contract had been properly performed. And we looked at you know, the equation of expected damages equals uh, expected uh, benefits minus expected costs. So uh, all of that seems to uh, emphasize uh, that we, we compensate for monetary losses or dollar dollar losses but how do we deal with intangible losses you know, especially emotional distress that arises from a breach from a breach of contract the the problem the the legal problem is that intangible losses have no apparent economic value so things such as disappointment you know anger frustration and sadness it, we, we, we can't put an economic value, or it's very difficult to put an economic value you know, to those types of losses. 
So the courts in Canada have traditionally denied grant, uh, granting or ordering damages, you know, for emotional emotional distress. Now there is there is an, a, a an exception to that rule. Um, if if peace of mind was expected uh, was an expected contractual benefit, then emotional distress is treated in the same manner as as other types of law of losses, especially monetary losses. So in, in those types of situations, a court will order damages for for emotional distress. So typically, a contract uh, where an expected contractual benefit is peace of mind would be contracts such as a an insurance contract of you know for you know disability insurance or or life insurance where a consumer is purchasing or entering into that insurance contract you know, for the purpose of getting peace of mind there is the the Supreme Court of Canada case Fiddler and Sun Life Sun Life Assurance where aggravated damages for mental distress that the plaintiff suffered as a result of the insurance company's refusal to pay disability benefits were ordered or were allowed by the court. Now, just because an amount is determined to be needed to put an innocent party back in the same financial position that it, it expected to be in if the contract had been properly performed, you know, that is not enough uh, for a court to grant that amount as damages. A court will also look or apply two, two, two legal tests or two legal doctrines to limit the, the amount of expectation damages that a plaintiff would be entitled to. Those doctrines are called the doctrine of remoteness and the doctrine of mitigation. The case which sets out the principles for the doctrine of remoteness is the English Court of Appeal case called Victoria Laundry and Newton Industry. The facts of this case are that the, the manufacturer, Newton Industries, had a contract to deliver a new boiler to Victoria Laundry. Uh, however, uh, Newton delivered that boiler 20 weeks late, and Victoria Laundry sued, Newton's, uh, sued Newton for its losses that it suffered that were caused by that 20-week delay. So La Victoria Laundry claimed a, a, a loss of uh, ordinary business income of 16 pounds per week. So these losses arise from their, ar arose from their ordinary laundry uh, operations. They also claimed a loss of 262 pounds per week because you know, they, they lost the, the opportunity to, to get a lucrative government contract uh, because they didn't have this, they didn't have this boiler. The legal issue in this case is, you know, what losses are Victoria Laundry entitled to be compensated for? The legal principles that the court applied here is, is that first, the, the defendant is liable for losses caused by a breach of contract that are not too remote. So, what does that mean? Not too remote. A loss is not remote if either the defendant actually knew that the loss might occur on a breach of contract, so we look at the actual knowledge of the defendant, or a reasonable person would have expected or foreseen that the loss may result from the breach of contract. So we apply this reasonable person test or reasonable foreseeability test at the time the contract was created. So when the court applied those legal principles, applied the law to the facts, so what, what conclusions did they, did they come to? They, they said that the loss of the ordinary laundry business income, that's the 16 pounds per week, was reasonably ex expectable, even if the manufacturer was not told about it. So that, that 16 pounds per week, Victoria Laundry will, you know, will be compensated for. The other conclusion was that the loss of the government contract was not reasonably expected, expectable, since it was highly unusual. So it, it wasn't often, or it wasn't on a regular basis, that that Victoria Laundry had an opportunity to to get a government contract from that. So it wasn't reasonably expectable 
that they would they would have that loss arising from the breach of contract. So the court ordered Newton compensate uh, Victoria Laundry for the sixteen pound per week losses, but not for the two hundred sixty two pound per week losses arising from the loss of that government contract. The other legal doctrine that limits expectation damages is the doctrine of mitigation. Under that doctrine, the plaintiff or the innocent party has a duty to take reasonable steps to minimize their losses. If they, failure to, if they fail to mitigate their losses, then their, their damages that they are entitled to will be reduced to the extent the losses were not reasonably avoided. Back to Drew and Justin. So two weeks before the birthday, Justin tells Drew that he will not be showing up at her party. Heartbroken, Drew cancels the party. Drew sues Justin, claiming the following expectation damages. Loss of deposits for the banquet hall and the caterer, which is $10,000. Loss of gifts from her friends and family attending the party, which is estimated to be about $100,000. Loss of future income. So this incident caused Drew to fall into a depression, which caused her to quit school, which led to the loss of her promising career as an accountant. So she estimates the loss of that future income uh, to be about $1 million. So would a court award her these damages? Let's now look at each of those three damages that Drew is claiming and apply the three different legal tests that, that are applicable. The first, if you look along the left-hand column, the first legal test is does, you know, does that, does, do those damages put Drew in the same financial position as if the contract was performed? The, the second test is, is remoteness. You know, did did the defendant know about the potential loss, or the defendant being being just in this case, or was the loss reasonably expected or foreseeable from the breach of contract? And the third is mitigation. Did the plaintiff Drew take reasonable steps to minimize her losses? So let's look first at the loss of the deposits worth ten thousand dollars. So by paying her damages of $10,000, then Drew would be put in the same financial position as if the contract was performed. Drew would not have lost the deposits if Justin had performed as required by the contract. The second legal test of remoteness. It is probably reasonably expected or foreseeable that Justin's failure to perform would cause the cancellation of the party and thus the loss of those deposits. So the, 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 the test of remoteness is probably satisfied. The last legal test of mitigation. Now, Drew could have taken reasonable steps to avoid losing the deposits by trying to find another performer for the party. This, if she had done that, that could have reduced or eliminated her claim for, for the loss of the deposits. Let's now look at the loss of the gifts worth an estimated $100,000. So would, would giving her the $100,000 as damages put her in the same financial position? Probably not. So although she didn't get, get the gifts because she canceled the party, Drew also didn't have to pay uh, Justin and any, any other costs associated with the party. Remember, expectation damages equals expectation expected benefits minus expected costs. So even though she would have had the benefit of $100,000 worth of gifts, she would have also incurred other costs that would have more than offset that $100,000 of gifts. The second, the second test of remoteness is not, is not applicable. If you don't pass the first test of uh, have the damages putting putting her in the same financial position as if the contract was performed. We don't have to look at the test for remoteness or the test for 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 mitigation. Let's now look at the claim for the loss of the future career income. So would would that put her in the same financial position as if the contract was performed? And the answer would be yes. If Justin had performed Drew would not have become depressed and she would not, not have lost her accounting career and then she would not have lost 
that estimated income of a hundred million, sorry, of one million dollars. How about remoteness? It's probably that claim is probably too remote. It's probably not reasonable, reasonably foreseeable that Justin's no show at the party would cause Drew to lose her potential accounting career. So, so because it's not reasonably foreseeable, this denies her full claim for the loss of income as being too remote. So we, we, we don't even need to look at the doctrine of, of mitigation. But you know, for, for the sake of, uh, of, of interest, let's, let's have a look at it anyways. Let's apply mitigation to that, to that claim. So even if it was reasonably foreseeable, Drew, Drew must take reasonable steps to treat her depression and to try to have a productive career. This could reduce or eliminate her claim for the loss of future income. She, so she can't just you know, do nothing about, about, her, about her loss of career or about her depression. She still has to, has to you know, seek treatment and, and try to have some sort of productive career if she's you know, either as an accountant or, or, as, or as anything else. So, so her loss would be somewhat less than $1 million dollars.